recording. All right, so let's go ahead and get today's class started. So we have a question about the previous lab. This is for today. So the previous lab is uh, this one, right? The LDSQ and LDI instruction. So is there a specific question? The last one? Uh, okay. And we have time to go over the, the drop down. Because oh, the problem the, with the drop down for me was like, uh -huh. you either get it right or you get it wrong. Yes. So there was no way for me to, like, okay, well, maybe. To find out which one is wrong. Yeah, like, you know. Yeah, with this one, you know, I don't think uh, turning on, you know, showing you the, you know, it will show you, you know, the score for this question, but it won't show you which one it does, it is wrong. Help me out to get better on yeah. that one. <laughs> All right. So, which one do you want me to work on? Uh, the last well, one first. Yeah, the last one. That one. If you can go through the drop down, then that's fine. If we have time, if not, then that's okay. Okay. So the last one is essentially just you know, asking you to run this as a program. Um, the question is, uh, when this program cannot go any further, what is the value in register B? So as long as you can answer this question, you know, you're fine. So there are several ways to answer this question. I have to be mindful of the time because you know, I may not have enough time to talk about what you need for today's lab. So for this one, you know, one way to do this is to use the assembler and just you know, copy and paste the whole code into the source tab. Mm -hmm. So let me erase this first. Let me switch back, oh, actually. Wrong thing to do because I have to go here. Okay, so one thing to do is to copy this and then just go to the assembler tab and paste it here. And then what you do is go to the RAM file, um, file, download, CSV, and I'm going to call this one mystery because we have no idea what opcode is in here, but it does something. So after this, we can start up Logisim. So All right, so here's Logisim, and then we load the processor. Okay, so there we go. Go to RAM, right click, load image, and it is mystery, mystery.csv. And then just run the code. So you click uh, Control K, okay, and then you stop it. You go to Register B inside the Register Bank, and Register B has a value of zero four. So that's how you find the solution of this particular question. <clears throat> so let me switch back here to answer the question. So for this one, you know, the answer is just you know, uh, four is a base ten number, okay. So the, the point of this question is, um, you, okay, there are a few points. L1 is a label. So you know, what it means is, in this case, your L1 is defined to be just a box name of the address of whatever is following it. So this byte, you know, this also has L1 in it, is uh, the address of this particular byte is how we define L1. So when you go to the assemble tab, you can actually see that happening. So if you go to switch to the assemble tab, um, you can see how you know location 04 has a content of 04. Because this byte is at location 04, and the way I want the uh, the way I want to define or specify the content of this particular location is the address of itself. Okay? Now, what about the rest? Well, the rest is actually, these are all instructions. So 60 is corresponding to a particular um, opcode. I believe it is LDI uh, loading into, in this case, 01, which is register B. And I'm loading 4 into register B. And then 75, I think, is a LD instruction. So it's basically using register B to act as an address. Go to that location in RAM retrieve the value of that location and put it into register B, which is also just four. So that's why by the time we get to the whole instruction, uh, register B has a value of four. So that's kind of the, so it's not, it doesn't say that in the assignment, in the, in so the. So it was more about just 
plug in and you get them in the soul. Yes. And actually tracing what is happening. It's not so much about tracing, but it also kind of gives you some idea of, you know, you can actually use the byte directive to write the entire program. It's going to be very painful to do it this way because it, that's the whole point of using the assembler is we can use mnemonic so that it's easier for us, your humans, you know, to specify you know, the instructions that you want to execute. But if you want to hand assemble everything and use a program, you can do it that way too. So that's kind of the whole point of question number eight. So as to question number... Uh, I don't think you have to go through it. It just was more like very hard to get help from. Because mm -hmm. yeah. there was no way that you get it right or you get it wrong. And then sometimes when you will put something like right, then mm -hmm. you will be, maybe have doubt mm -hmm. because it was right. Well, there's a way to kind of do this. So, you know, the way, okay, so I, I'll just kind of demonstrate. This is not really the preferred way to get this you know, thing done, but you can actually just answer one part of it each time and then submit the attempt and then see if you okay, got it like right. You learn different but you do this first, right? You, you do this first, okay, you get all of these hands, your parts right, then you move on to the other questions. So that's one way to do it. For instance, in this case, your know, address mux is, um, you know, it, it basically determines, you know, which uh, register connects to um, the A port of RAM. So if you look at all of these possible options, um, so it would be one to connect input one to RAM.A, the connect, it connects the value of the PC to RAM.A. That is likely to be the correct answer. So, you know, one way to do this is simply to submit quiz right now and see if I get partial credit, like just one point out of that, that particular question. So I just kind of fast forward to number four and it is wrong. Okay, you know, so, you know, that is not the correct answer. And then the last one, I think is four that is correct. So if you go to the last one, that is, that is correct. All right, so I think in the in the actual question, you know, in the actual question, I think ADDR uh, mux is supposed to be zero, so it would actually choose input zero instead of choosing input one. Yep. All right, so um, a few things that I want to point out. So is that okay? Let me just kind of stop the review yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, you're good. It's just okay. 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 Yeah, I can I can talk about that during the lab time if we have time left over. Um, I actually made two videos over the weekend. You know, one I just made this morning. Um, the first one is how to track instruction execution in TDP. So in this particular one, I'm using, I was using uh, the PDF that contains the circuit of the processor, the ALU, and also the um, register bank, and then use you know, some color highlighting to track you know, how things are connected. And also I wrote some comments you know, wrote down some numbers you know, in the select of the multiplexer and the demultiplexer. So I'm just illustrating you know, ways to help you track down how everything connects inside the processor and also the sequence and what tools I, you know, I would use to do that. So obviously you don't have to use a PDF. You can, in fact, the best way to do it is to print it out, okay? And then use a highlighter, you know, just get a fancy set of your know, multi-color you know, highlighter so that way you can use a different color for every purpose. And then use a very fine you know, pencil, like a 0.2 millimeter you know, mechanical pencil would do just, just fine. And then you just you know, kind of jot down the value at the select bit of the multiplexer and the demultiplexer, and also the one versus the zero for the enable or the select. So that way you have one sheet that is specific to one instruction. And then you do the same thing for you know, all the instructions that we have talked about so far. So by doing that, you know, you're getting yourself more familiarized with the processor, not only from the theoretical perspective, but also from the spatial perspective, it's easier for you to find you know, where the program counter is, you know, easier to find you know, where the RAM is, where there's the flag register and so on, because the more you do this, you know, the more familiar you get with the layout of the processor. I do have a question that I yeah. Yeah, on the spreadsheet, you have, uh, some of them have the background yellow and some of them have the background red. I don't remember whether it was um, an instruction. Oh, you mean in the optical table? Yes. Um, 
Yeah, these are basically the ones that are yellow are the ones that are relatively new. The ones that are red are not really used anymore. So they are, they do exist, okay? They still work. It's just that most of the time we don't use them. For the purpose of the class, you have you know, so many fellows. Just what I'm going to do is just go through each one and basically map it out. With the red one, the only one that is useful is this one. And then with everything else, you know, we do kind of use every everything, everything else. else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is called a risk architecture, you know, um, which is re reduced instruction set computer. Um, so we only have like less than thirty, like twenty five or twenty six instructions. With an Intel architecture, the x eighty six architecture, which is the de facto standard platform for teaching this class, it has two hundred plus instructions. And then each instruction also has like 16 addressing modes where we only have three. So this in this particular processor, you know, has um, it reduces you know the the basic stuff that the processor can do. So in order to get something meaningful done, you know, to translate the pro C C plus plus program into assembly, we just need to use more instructions to get the same thing done. Okay. All right. So, oh right. So we. So the announcement, there's, a, there's one more that I uh, made just this morning. You may, you may not have time to you know, watch this one yet. It's because in class, I keep you know, saying, okay, this is what is the next natural question to ask? So what seems to be natural to me may not be natural to you because you're new to this processor and also the components. So I made a separate video to talk about you know, what those questions are and how do you figure out those questions for yourself. So you know, if, if I were to summarize the, the entire video, it has to do with one, what the device is supposed to do. What can it do? And two, what does it need to get a job done? So if you can answer those two questions, then you can you know, extend those two questions to ask, oh, okay, now that I know this device is enabled, it is going to update itself, okay? And one of the things this particular device, a register can do, is to update its value. So the next question is, um, who is specifying the value to update this register with? Okay, so that's the kind of thinking that I usually do. Um, you know, I call this dependency thinking. You know, what does it depend on? And then you track down all the dependency. So that's just my term of referencing this kind of reasoning or thinking. It is not specific to this class. Okay, you know, this technique can also be used for many of your other classes too. All right, so are there any additional questions that I need to address before we move on to today's lecture? Seeing none, I am going to continue with today's lecture then. Okay, so today's lecture talks about branching, okay, which is changing the program counter and thereby, you know, uh, altering the path of execution. So up to this point, okay, if you are to go to the processor, okay, let me go back to logic sim, which is right here. The natural way of executing a program is just linear. Okay, so if I am going to clear the content here, okay, and go through a lower tick frequency because I want you to see how we are sequentially going through the program. And then control K, you can see how you know, we are just going through sequential instructions in RAM, okay? And the program is executing right now. Does it do anything useful? Nope. It's just executing a bunch of no-op instructions and therefore doing absolutely nothing. But what I want to show you is the sequential nature of a normal program, okay? Once you're done with one instruction, it just moves on to the next one. Once it's done with the next one, it moves on to the next one and so on, okay? So... This is you know, just you know, executing you know, opcode in sequence. It is good, but it's not going to be sufficient to specify your program. Because in C++, in Python, in any programming language, you have conditional statements. You have loops. So you have to evaluate conditions. And sometimes you go like, oh, OK, we'll go to the RAM branch. And other times you want to go to the else branch. Right? So right now, we don't have the ability to do any kind of branching. So that's what today's lecture is about, is we are going to talk about how to perform branching. There are, there's a whole family, okay, of branch instructions, 
And I would basically look at the yellow ones, okay? These are the branch instructions. Anything that starts with a J, which stands for jump, is a branch instruction. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the, is the JMPI instruction. The JMPI instruction, like the LBI instruction, takes an immediate operand, which means the opcode takes a one byte, but then the following byte is also important because it specifies, oh, where should I go to continue execution? The um, RTL is described like this, okay? The RTL describes this operation as using the program counter as a pointer, the references, grab the content that the program counter is pointing to, and then use that to overwrite the program counter itself. Okay, it sounds pretty well, like, okay, but that is just weird, okay? Well, you know, when we, you know, if we just kind of demonstrate it, it's not gonna be weird <clears throat> because we can actually see the mechanism. So the opcode is 4-1 because 0, 1, 0, 0 is a 4, 0, 0, 0, 0 is a 0 in hexadecimal. And then the next byte is simply what you want to specify. So in the assembler, I can demonstrate this particular instruction uh, just by you know, assembling a very small program. So let's just say that for whatever reason, I want to jump and continue execution at location, I don't know, you know let's try uh, B or the uh, location 11. So that's basically how you specify the instruction. JMPI is the mnemonic for jump immediate. And then 11, not L1, this is actually 11, is the location that we want to continue execution at. So that means in between, you can specify whatever, okay, between location, between this instruction and location 11, you can have anything, it doesn't care. So when you look at the assemble tab, okay, you can see how you know, the JMPI instruction takes up two bytes. The first byte is four, uh, four zero, which is the opcode. And then the second byte is zero B, which is the hexadecimal version of 11. Okay, so that's what the second byte is for, is it specifies where are we supposed to go to? That's what the second byte is for, okay? So when we you put this into the uh, processor, I can just kind of poke it in, okay? In other words, I'm using the poking tool. Um, not quite at this point, okay? Because you know, the program counter is not pointing at the space that I needed to point to. So I'm just gonna reset the entire processor so that the program counter is back to location zero, zero. Okay. Where's my mouse pointer? There we go. All right, so we go to this location, change it to a four zero, then change this to zero B. In other words, instead of downloading the CSV and then loading the image into RAM, I'm just gonna shortcut the entire thing. So now we want to track down the execution. So once again, I'm gonna fast forward and fast track the first four ticks, okay? The first you know, four you know, um, transitions. One, two, three, four, okay? So now we are right after decode and before execute. So now we go back to the processor and go like, okay, let's analyze what's going on inside the processor right now. And the way we do this is to look for things that are enabled, things that are selected, otherwise there are things that are active, okay? You can see the register bank does not have any light green stuff coming in, so that means you know, at least we are not updating any register. The ALU is the same thing, the enable is also turned off. And then we look at RAM, ah, okay, RAM is selected. As soon as RAM is selected, we know that RAM is going to do something. So remember you know, what I just said a little bit earlier? The quote unquote natural question to ask is to remember what does RAM do, okay? It can do one of two things. One, it can recall the content at a location. Two, it can overwrite or update the content at a location. So the question is, uh, but which one is it doing this time? It's reading because LD is a one. So when you see LD being a one, that means we are reading from RAM. But that also means, okay, so now we have, you know, if you think about what it needs for reading, it needs to know which location to read, okay? In other words, you know, we are now looking at what does it need to get a job done? We know what work or what kind of a job it needs to do right now. We are now asking, what does it need to get a job done? Uh, it needs the address. But 
knowing the address is zero one in hexadecimal is not enough because I need to know who is specifying the zero one here. We track it way back to this multiplexer. It has a light green here. It is selecting one to the output of the multiplexer and that's coming from the program counter. So at this point, we know the program counter is connected to the address for the RAM acting as a pointer. So the next question, which is not part of what does the RAM need in order to get the job done, is to look at the program counter itself. So when you look at the program counter itself, you can see the enable is a bright green, which means the program counter is enabled. It is about to update. So, um, so now you say, okay, the, the, the register has two things that it can do. One is presenting its contents, which it is doing right now, okay? It is the output of the program counter is outputting to the address port of RAM. But the second thing it can do is to update itself. And it can do both at the same time, unlike RAM, which cannot do both at the same time, a register can. So in this case, the register is, is going to be updated. Then you have to ask, what does it need in order to update itself? Oh, it probably needs to know the new value of the update, right? So that's why we have to track down the D port because the D port is the input. That is how we specify the new value of the register. So is that line of reasoning okay? All right, because sometimes I can skip a few steps in between and not noticing that I have skipped a few steps because they're all connected in my head already. So I have to be careful not to do that. All right, so now we, you know, it is the output of a multiplexer. This multiplexer has a bright green line here so this time we are going to go to PC Mux, Mux, PC Mux and find out why it is a bright green. So PC Mux is right here, okay? It is the output of this multiplexer and there's only one input that is a bright green at this point. So that has to be the one that is being selected right now. But to double check, we can click on PC Mux, Mux and it indeed has a value of 111, which is seven. And this is input seven. It is connected to the output and that eventually becomes PC Mux here which then select input one to connect to the output. So now we track this one back to here. This is the output of the other, another multiplexer. The select here is a bright green and we want to find out why. Well, PCMux is a one. We know the reason why PCMux is a one already. R-O-0-E-N is, uh, is, a, is a zero, but it, because it is negated, it becomes a one. One and one is a one. So that's why you know, the select of this multiplexer is also a one, which means now we track down input one to the multiplexer and see where that leads me. And we can see how it is connected ultimately to the data port of RAM, which is already outputting the content at location zero one, which is zero B. So zero B is the content or the value of the location zero one. So that means when I perform an up uh, rising edge, the program counter is going to update to zero B. Okay, so we'll go ahead and control T it. There we go. So we can now see that the program counter is updated to zero B. Um, and then the following edge is going to go back to location zero, zero, zero. So we'll be ready for the next fetch operation. So let's do that. Control T right there. So we can see how the instruction register or the micro component, sorry, the micro component is now back to location zero, zero, zero and we're about to have a rising edge. That tells me that we are about to fetch the next opcode. The big question is, where are we getting the next opcode? It is now at location zero B. I just altered the usual sequential nature of running a program because I skipped all the locations from location two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A. So I skipped nine bytes to get to location zero B to continue executing. Do we have any questions about the branch, the unconditional branch instruction, otherwise known as jump immediate? It doesn't ask any question, okay? Every time you get to a JMPI instruction, it will continue execution at the location that you specify. Are we good with that so far? Okay, all right. So the JMPI instruction is great for making an infinite loop, okay? So if I want to give you an example of an infinite loop, I don't, okay, I'm gonna close the browser here and see if this will help. Um, 
the problem because I have a little bit of a problem if that it wants to kind of scroll beyond the screen because the one window was using that portion. So we'll see whether that this fixes the problem or not. All right, so we're going to go back to the RAM here. And this time I'm going to change the RAM and change this back to location 00. zero. This is not location, but opto 00. zero. And then right here, I wanted to jump back to location 00. zero. So I have a 40 as the optode and then 00 as the destination where it's supposed to jump back to. Eh, let's make it 01, okay? So this is going to jump back to location 01. And I need to reset the processor because I want to illustrate what, how this program works. So I reset the processor without changing the RAM. So now we are starting at location 00 again. So when I run this code using control K, you can see how it is just you know, going around in the time loop because it was because it would it would start at location zero zero and then it will just kind of slide all the way down to the JMPI instruction. The JMPI instruction changes the path of execution back to location zero one, and then it slides down to go up. You know, it's called a slip, by the way. Okay, it's called a, a slide. Um, it's it just slides down the the no op instruction getting back to JMPI to location zero one, and it's a tight loop. Okay, it doesn't do anything particularly useful other than illustrating how we can use the JMPI instruction to go back to an earlier location in order to make a loop. Are we good so far? All right, infinite loops are usually not very useful. Okay, the only time you actually have an infinite loop is when you write an operating system, because at that a that a uh, an operating system usually has no particular reason to exit, okay, unless you want to power down the computer. So let's go ahead and control K, and this time we'll try to specify a conditional branch instruction. To understand a conditional branch instruction, let's go back to the browser, not this one, uh, this one here, and then go back to opto table. I'm going to pick a particular um, um, conditional branch instruction, let's just pick JCI, okay? So JCI, you know, if you look at the English description in column D, it says it jumps if and only if the Z flag is a one. Okay? In other words, it behaves just like a JMPI instruction, but only if the Z flag, the carry flag, is a one. What if the carry flag is a zero? Well, then it just goes like, I'm not gonna branch, I will just go to the next, the, the following instruction. Is that okay so far? All right. So what I can do is I can illustrate, you know, just two programs right now, um, you know, two instances of the same program, and then we can see how it can end up at a different halt instruction. So the opcode here is a four four. Okay. So opcode four four is representing JCI, and then I have to specify the destination. So now I go back to Logisim, and this time I can do a complete reset because I need to write the code, the, the entire program again. So here's 4.4, and I'm going to say if the carry flag is a 1, I want to go to location, let's say, 0.4, where I will put a halt instruction. 0.1 is the opcode of the halt instruction. The halt instruction does one thing. Guess what it does? Yep, exactly, the halts, okay? It basically stops the execution of the program. Any further, you can still clock, okay? The clock can be active, but once you get to the halt instruction, the execution of the code does not go beyond that point. Okay, but I will also put a, another no op over here. So now I have two no op instruct. I mean, uh, excuse me, I have two halt instructions. So the question is, which one is going to be the actual sort of, sort of final resting place of this particular program. Is it the halt instruction at location 0, 02 or is it the halt instruction at location 0, 04? Where the mouse pointer is, is location 0, 02. This is location 0, 04. So I have two possibilities now. So to get this to work, okay, we are going to you know, go to the decode, you know, run right past the decode, and then we look at the execution phase you know, without actually uh, making the rising edge trans transition. So once again, you have four control Ts, one, two, three, four. We have just decoded the, um, the opcode of four, four in hexadecimal. And now we can look at all the things here and try to figure out what it is going to do. 
Um, nothing is happening inside the register bank. We are not using the ALU. The flag register is not being changed, okay? So, you know, the way I said that means, you know, well, maybe we are using the flags register after all. It's just that we're not changing it. The program counter is being changed, okay? You can see how the program enable is, PC enable is, is a bright green. And RAM is also selected as well, just like last time. In other words, it looks just like the JMPI instruction, except for one thing, okay? How does it get PC Mux this time? So this time you can see how PC Mux is currently you know, choosing a zero. But the question is, uh, which zero are we choosing? Because when you look at the multiplexer <clears throat> that is going to um, get the output to PC Mux, it has six, seven zeros to choose from. Input zero to input six, they're all zeros. But which one are we choosing from? How can we tell? <clears throat> Can someone tell me how I can tell which one of these seven zeros I'm choosing from? PC Mux Mux. PC Mux Mux. Okay, so we click on PC Mux Mux and it says zero, zero, zero. So we look at input zero and go like, okay, so this is how we picked up the zero to become PC Mux. But when you look at this uh, zero here, it is a little strange. It is not a constant of zero like, you know, input five and six. This one goes back. Okay, so we go, it goes, it comes from the splitter, but the splitter goes all the way back, guess what, to the flex register. In other words, bit zero of the flex register is what is determining the value of PC Mux. Is that okay? Oh, hmm. if that is the case, that means if I somehow change the flex you know, you know, register here, so that it becomes zero one, aha. Uh -huh. You can see how PC Mux is now a one. Now, why is that important? Because the reason why this is important is because this is how we make decisions. I'm, I'm scrolling so that I can still see the entire multiplexer up here while being able to see the program counter all the way back here. So you can now see how PC Mux, which is the out, right now, the multiplexer that is outputting the PC Mux is basically saying, Whatever bit zero of the flex register is, is PC Mux. But when you look at a row of PC Mux, it is actually very important this time because the PC Mux as a tunnel is acting as the select of this multiplexer. So let's look at you know, what it is choosing from. Input zero is the output of just the adder. In other words, I'm just adding one to the program counter if PC Mux is a zero but PC Mux ultimately connects to bit zero or the carry flag of the flags register. So that means if the flags register is remembering there has been no carry from the previous add, subtract, or compare instruction, then it simply goes like, eh, we'll just move on to location zero two because it just auto increments the program counter. But what if the carry flag is a one, which is you know, the current state right now? then it will take input one instead of input zero, and input one is coming from this multiplexer. This multiplexer also makes use of PC Mux, but this time it is also important because you know, the output of this AND gate is a one, so that means it is we're connecting all the way back to the D port of RAM. In other words, whatever we store at location zero one will be loaded into the program counter so that we are altering the path of execution, but if and only if the carry flag or bit zero of the flags register is a one. That is ultimately how we make a decision and go like, well, sometimes we go here and other times we just kind of, we'll just follow, you know, we'll, we'll execute whatever is following immediately, you know, the instruction JPI in this case. So I'm gonna pause here, okay? You know, one comment that I got over the weekend was you know, when I asked you guys you know, to see if, you, if there are any questions, I did not leave enough time. So I'm gonna give you guys a little bit more time. Yes, go ahead. I think the assembler just disconnected. What time again? The assembler. The assembler has not, does not have the JCI instruction yet. So I will need to put it there. 
and I cannot remember which browser I'm using. Nope, this one, not this one. Yep, that one. So go to the assembler. So right now it only has the JMPI instructions. Do you want me to change that to JCI? Okay. So the only change to JCI to what location? Four. Okay. So the only change in this case is the opcode. You can see the opcode of JCI is 44, and this is where we want to go to if and only if the carry flag is a one. All right. But the most important part of the conditional branch instruction is the connection of one of the five bits, okay, to PC Mux. And then PC Mux is making the actual decision of, hey, should we just kind of auto instrument because you know, the flag is a zero, or should we go to the location that is specified by the byte that is following the opcode itself? That is the, the really key importance of this, of this entire discussion. So are we doing okay so far with this discussion? Are we understanding the mechanism of how decision is made? If I am to identify the key concepts to you know, kind, of, kind of understand this part, the, the key concept here is what a multiplexer do, what a multiplexer does to choose. In this case, you know, because the input is a single bit, it is just a binary thing, it is acting as an if statement, so to speak. Okay, it is choosing which input, or if you will, it is actually, if I were describing this, it is more like a ternary expression where this is the first item, this is the second item, this is the third item of a ternary expression. All right, so are we doing okay so far with this? So at this point, you are going to write code that will involve loops and stuff like that, okay? So let me go ahead and so the way I present this material for this class is slightly different from you know, how I present the material in my uh, Tuesday, Thursday class. The reason is I need to give you, uh, because we use a little bit more time at the beginning, you know, um, so I need to kind of make up for that time. So I'm gonna present the material in a way where you can follow the instruction a little bit better. Um, the lab is not released yet, so that means you guys cannot quite get to it yet. But when you get to the last question, okay, the last question is the, the one that is a little bit more complicated. You know, it is, it's a little long, okay, it's a little complicated. And, oh, okay, has got something like this. Um, but that's not my question. The question is number five. All right, so this is question number five. I'm giving you a chunk of code. You don't have to understand what it is, okay? All you need to do is to copy and paste it. So copy, go to, your, go to the assembler, go to the source tab, erase everything in column A, and then just paste the entire code. What you do need to do is to change uh, the byte here to your actual student ID. Okay, so my ID is 0, 0, 0, 6, 8, 8, 7. So obviously, you need to put in your own code, okay? And there's one thing here that does not assemble. This program actually does not work because, and it will complain about it, because JXI does not exist. So JXI in this case is just a placeholder. It is a placeholder to say, hey, change this instruction JXI to JCI, JZI, JOI, JSI, and a JLI, one at a time, okay? So I'm gonna change it to say JCI first. Okay, so I change it to JCI. And now the program assembles because JCI is an actual instruction. So as soon as the program assembles, I go to the RAM file tab, go to download, and I will download it to CSV. And I will name this CSV to be jci.csv, just so that I remember you know, what this program is for. Now, obviously, I've done this before, and that's why I have to overwrite the other file. 
So now I go back to uh, logic in, do a control R, reset the entire code, and right click here, load image. Okay. Oh, that's not the image I want to load. It is um, jci.csv. Okay. So this is a rather large program. Okay. You know, it, it is a little complex. You don't need to know how the program runs. What I do need you to tell me, okay, let me go back to the code first. Let me go back to the question here. What I do need you to tell me is the number of times this particular node op executes. Okay? I want you to tell me when this program runs, how often do we get to this particular instruction and execute this node op? There are two node op instructions in the entire program but I'm only interested in counting the number of times that I run this particular no op. Is that okay? So there are a few ways to do this, okay? The really ultimately painful way to do this is to go to Logisim and, well, excuse me, let me backtrack a little bit here. Go to the assemble tab and figure out you know, what is the location of the no op instruction right after the L2 label. So that one is going to be right below here. This is the no op instruction that I'm concerned about. It has an address of 1.7. In other words, when the program counter is 1.7 and I'm fetching, I'm executing this no op instruction. So one thing you can do is to control T all the way until the program counter reach 1.7 and the micro code pointer is 0, 0, 0, and the clock is low, because when you control T right at that moment, that counts as one execution of this no op instruction. And you have to keep doing this until the entire program gets to the halt instruction. So that's gonna take a while, okay, which I do not recommend doing this way. But if anyone wants to do it this way, you can go ahead and do it this way. So the second way to do this is to go like, that is painful. I don't want to do something like this. So the other way to do this is to make use of a log feature inside Logisim. So when you go to simulate and you go to logging, you can see that hmm, all of these things are things that I can log. In other words, I can, whenever something changes of the things that I'm watching, then it will create an entry of, oh, by the way, this thing just changed, okay, you know, um, so, hmm, okay. So what do you think I should log when I need to figure out whether the instruction at 1.7 or you know, how many times the instruction at location 1.7 um, executes? Indirectly, I'm really asking, how do I know where an opcode is coming from? <coughs> Because I don't care about whether the instruction at location, say, 1.4 executes, okay? How many times it executes, that does not concern me, okay? So the only instruction that I'm concerned about is the one that is located at location 1.7 in hexadecimal. So the question is, how can I tell where is the instruction that I'm executing? So let's, this screen is not going to, well, actually, this screen does help. Okay, when I switch to here. So of all the things that we have talked about, which one tells you about the location of the instruction that is about to execute? Or, okay. When you think about instruction execution, how many phases are there to instruction execution? Can somebody tell me those few steps of executing an instruction? <clears throat> The first one starts with an F. It starts, it starts with fetching, okay? We fetch the opcode. Then we decode the opcode, and then we execute the instruction. So there, those are the three phases. Which phase relies on the, which, which phase will tell me where the instruction is? Fetch, exactly. Because when you're fetching, how do you fetch? You have to go to RAM, 
and then have the program counter to tell you which location they're reading from, that's set, right? So don't you think that particular step will tell us, oh, okay, so fetch needs to know where the opcode is in order to get his job done. But in order to do that, which register, again, will tell me where to fetch? I just mentioned it like 10 seconds ago, yes? The program counter, okay. So do you think the program counter is one of the things that we should log? Is that okay? Okay, so yes. So the answer is yes, we need to log the program counter. But the more important question is, did you guys follow the line of reasoning that I just did? Okay, we'll start with what we need to do, okay, for, for the lab, okay? We need to count the number of times that the no op at location 17 executes. We need to count how many times it executes. Well, in order to do that and differentiate the execution of all of the other instructions, the only thing I can rely on is not the opcode itself because there's another opcode called no op in the entire program. So I cannot just count the number of times that we execute no op because there are multiple no op. The only thing I can rely on that is unique to this one no op is where it is. Okay? Because there's only one place of this particular no op, nobody else can use the same location. Okay, so that means the location of this no op is of significance. So then the next question is how do I know where the CPU, where the processor gets its opcode. Because if I can determine that, then I can say, maybe we now have a way to track where we're getting the opcode. So that goes back to how do we get an opcode to execute to begin with? That is the fetch phase of instruction execution. So we then look into the fetch phase of instruction execution and go like, in order to fetch the opcode from memory, so that we can later on decode it, what does it need? Well, obviously we need RAM, because RAM is holding all the opcodes, but we also need the program counter, because the program counter is the one register that is telling me where to fetch the opcode. Is that okay? So now I go like, oh, okay. Is the program counter one of the things that I can log? Yes, okay? All the registers and all the outroutines can be logged. So if there's any change to the program counter, it can make a new line. Are we doing okay so far with that line of reasoning? But your program can access this location, but not to execute it. In other words, there may be some other instructions that are just going like, I want to read from location 17, but I'm not executing that location. Or I'm not executing the opcode at that location. So that means hmm, this thing by itself is okay, but just to make sure that I only count the number of times that we execute the instruction at the location, I might want to also um, you know, log off fetch. Because off fetch is a one if and only if we are fetching from that location. So we want to add that. So we look at off fetch in the main circuit and ask, what does it do again? What is off fetch? So op fetch is one of the output pins. Okay, it's still doing the other thing. Okay. I just have to move my mouse slower, like so. So this is op fetch. When does op fetch become a one? Well, first of all, the instruction register has to be enabled because it is sharing the same pin, the same node as what connects to the enable of the instruction register. But this is an AND gate in order for the output to be a one, both inputs need to be ones. What is the other input? Clock. So that means you know, only at the moment when we have the clock being high, which means we just have a rising edge and we are updating the instruction register, only at that point, the op fetch output pin is gonna become a one. So that means every time op fetch becomes a one, it's telling me that we just fetched something. Is that okay? So that's why you know, this is 
also important because I need to make sure that I can differentiate between the cases of um, reading just location 17 versus fetching from location 17. So that means at this point, if I go back to logging, I have these two things being logged. So once you have determined what you need to log, then you need to determine where do you want to log it to. You can log it to a table, okay? You know, which means you, know, you just have to scroll through the table to find out you know, okay, the condition where you should do the counting, okay? I'm not gonna specify the condition, okay? I think I have already told you enough material that you can figure out you know, how to count, okay? What to count and what not to count. So that's one way to do it. I'll show you the output if I do it this way. So I can now close the window and just execute the program at full speed. So this time I am going to execute at the maximum speed because there's no way to visualize you know, the execution of the program. And the only thing I really need to show you is the halt pin here, control K. All right, so now we have halted. So now I go back to simulate, go back to logging, go back to the table, and this is the output, okay? And basically you have to look at the output here and figure out how many times did I fetch from location from the location where the no op instruction is located? I don't want to make it too easy for you, so I have to mentally actually make sure I don't tell you more than what I should. Okay, but this is you know, the output, and you can see that yeah, you can scroll through this, okay, but it's not easy. You cannot use um, like certain features in an editor, for instance, to look for a specific pattern. You go like, hmm, that kind of sucks. Okay, if that sucks, you can use the file option. So with the file option means you, know, you are logging the output to a file. So now we can specify what file to log it to. Uh, I'm just going to say this is jci.tsv, not csv, because the output is actually a tab separator value file. So I'm going to override it, and then I close this window, and then I just have to go back, reset the clock, okay, and then reset the processor. The program is still the same, okay, you know, I just reset, you know, the program counter, but the RAM content is still the same as before. So once again, I do a control K, it executes the code all the way to reach the halt instruction, okay, halt is a one. So this time I have a file. I can use multiple ways to open the file, okay, so if I go to the command line interface, I can show you how to open that file. So go to the temp folder. I can open the file as a text file. So from your perspective, it's no, uh, notepad. From my perspective, it's called mousepad. Uh, this is jci.tsv. Um, okay. So you can, you can see how you know, it has basically the same content, but you're looking for a specific pattern. Um, without telling you what pattern you're supposed to be looking for, let me just kind of pick one that I'm just going to say, let's say you know, uh, I'm looking for the pattern where the first number is a zero, 06 and the second number is a zero, okay? which obviously is the wrong thing to look for. I'll let you guys determine what you, need, you actually need to look for. So I can now use a search feature here, and it's already telling me, you know, it tells me there are 14 matches which is kind of cool, right? Because you know, I don't actually need to do the counting because the program, the editor, is telling me the, the number of occurrences already. That's one way to do it. For those of you who like to use a spreadsheet, you can do it with a spreadsheet too. So I am going to say, don't save, there we go. So I'm using LibreOffice in, my, in this computer. You can use Excel if you want to. You can even use Google Sheets if you want to do it that way too. So in this one, I am using uh, tab separated. Oh, I specified the wrong file, didn't I? TSV is the one that has the log. CSV is the one that has the RAM content. So TSV is the one that I want to examine. It is a tab separated file. Okay, it's all good. So you can see this is the output of the spreadsheet, or you know, this is the same file visualized in the spreadsheet. So now you can specify, you can say, okay, how do I highlight only things that has a, I'm just using a wrong example here. So once again, do not copy you know, what I'm trying to do here. 
So you can basically say, okay, let's say we we're interested in location six, and it's a zero. Okay, I want to focus on anything that looks like this. So one way to do that is to use column C to do this. Um, you can basically just say, you know, um, a one. Okay, a one is a six. You can specify an and, okay? So you can say and um, a1 is a6, and then b1 is a0. <clears throat> and then we just you know, kind of copy this all the way down to the last line of the trace. But you can also, you'll see that the hexadecimal numbers are not being parsed correctly. So you have to be careful if you want to log anything that has the hexadecimal number. Okay, I think that's enough. You can see how you know, it would say true, true over here, and for everything it is false. Okay, so that's another way to do this. There are many, many ways to do this. You know, what you want to do is entirely up to you. Okay, it really depends on you know, how proficient you are with a spreadsheet, how proficient you are with an editor like Notepad, or some other editors. Okay, Notepad++, for instance, is probably a good use for this because I think Notepad++ allows you to specify a search string that has a tab in it. I do not know whether Notepad can do it because I don't use Notepad myself. Worse come to worse, okay? What you can do is simply to do it manually. So you just look at this and say, okay, I am just gonna look for you know, specific patterns. Okay, I want the first number to be a zero six, the second number to be a zero. So this is one, this is two, and then just carefully go through the whole thing, go like, oh, okay, here's another one, okay? This is three, this is four, and so on. All right, so I'm giving you the tools to do this. I'm not telling you what you should be looking for because I have already done so in an indirect way. So you just have to kind of parse what I said earlier and combine it with the technique of using a tool so that you can find the, the correct number of occurrences. All right, so I can tell you, oh, okay, this, I don't want to do that. So let me switch back to the lab. There we go. So if I go back to the lab, in this case, you have to uh, fill in this table. So you can copy and paste the table. Let me show you exactly how to do that. Okay, you just select the entire table, control C, control V, like so. And then the first thing you need to do is to follow the instruction, replace your set, replace this with your seven digit ID. So I have to say you know, 687. And then just tell me how many times the JCI instruction, um, how many times the no op instruction is execu has executed when the JXI instruction is JCI. And when you're done with this, well, you know, just repeat the whole thing, go back to the assembler, go to the source tab, and change the JCI instruction to the next one. Say JCI, and then repeat the entire experiment. Okay? There are a few things that you need to observe, okay? One is I know some people are going to try to use the same file for logging. If you are one of those people, you need to be careful. Because if you don't spe re-specify the input file, it will append. In other words, the same file, in this case, JCI, will just get longer and longer and longer. That is probably not what you want to do. So what you do need to do is to go to select and then re-specify the same file if that is your intention. So then you click Save again, and LogiStream will notice that you are specifying you're specifying a file that already exists. Then you have two options. You can overwrite the file, which means you erase the original file and then you log from the beginning again. Or you can append, which is you're keeping all the content as is, but adding additional content to the end of the original file. In this particular homework assignment, I cannot imagine any reason why anyone wants to append, so overwrite is the correct option in this case. So remember to do this, okay? Because otherwise the file will just be appended and it just get longer and longer. So you have to re you have to remember this step when you change the code 
from JCI to JCI, and then from JCI to JSI, and so on and so forth. All right, so operationally speaking, I think that should address that particular question. So once you know, we have talked about that question, there's one more question that is kind of cumbersome to answer. So let's move on to the next one. It's one of those questions that you know, kind of started out this class. It's one of those drop-down stuff again. <laughs> so this time, the drop-down is asking you what flags are going to be zeros and what flags are going to be one. So on the left-hand side of the equals are the actual code of the, the name of the flag. So we have the L flag, which is coming from binary subtraction, the overflow flag, which is also from binary subtraction, the sign flag of the difference or sum, which is also coming from the um, binary subtraction or binary comparison thing. The Z flag is you know, coming from earlier, you know, I think in the previous two classes or so, is the Z flag, you know, which is whether the result is zero or not. And then the carry flag is basically the carry or the borrow. If the previous operation is the subtraction, then the Z flag is the borrow flag. If the previous operation is an addition, the C flag is the carry flag. Okay, so there are several ways to uh, you know, to answer these questions. One is to do it just mentally. Okay, now if you do it mentally, you have to keep in mind you know the overflow flag is defined a little bit different for addition, because in order for an addition to to, to uh, activate the overflow, um, basically you have to look at um, You have to look at the sum here. If this is exceeding the range of an 8-bit signed integer, then the overflow becomes a 1. Okay, I'll give you an example. As an 8-bit number, you can only represent up to 127 on the positive side or down to negative 128 on the negative side. So if you want to subtract, if you want to add negative 1 to negative 128, the overflow flag will trigger. If you want to add 1 to 127, the overflow flag will trigger. Is that okay? So that's probably the only thing you need to know, you know about the overflow flag, is it also makes sense in binary addition. So once we know, you know, under um, addition, how overflow is defined, the L flag is still going to be the signed flag uh, exclusive for the, the overflow flag. So that part has not changed. So that means you know, once you understand what is overflow for addition, you, know, you can also determine the L flag for addition. Now, I know it doesn't make sense, okay? You know, because you know, if you're not comparing, there's no less than in this case, but that's basically how the L flag is actually defined in the circuit. So that's one way to do it. So getting back to how to answer this question, you can do this without logic sim. You just do the calculation by hand and then just you know, mentally calculate all of the flags and then answer the question. You can do it that way, okay? Um, the other way to do this, which I'm not gonna call is cheating, but it's definitely a shortcut, okay? Is to use logic sim. You go like, ah, okay, are you kidding me? You know, does that mean that I actually have to put in the code to perform those operations? Nope. All you need to do is to go to logic sim and this time you open just the ALU by itself. So let me move that into your view. Uh, nope. There we go. So this is just the ALU. So what you want to do is I want to perform addition. How do you perform an addition in the ALU? Where's my adder? Hmm? Sorry, go ahead. Um, no, those are not, that's not the adder. What, where is the adder that is actually performing the addition? Which of the component has a big plus sign in it? This thing. There's a gigantic plus here, right? That's our adder. This is our subtractor. 
So now the question is, if you want to use this mechanism to answer the question, how do you specify that we want to perform an addition? We just have to enable it. Okay, we have to enable it. Okay, fine, let's enable first. And then what? Okay, there's no activation of this. You know, this is always enabled. It doesn't have its own enable button. The, 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 the question is, how do we route in one and in two to the other? Okay, we want to connect this to you here. You want to make sure that you're passing the first value has got to be a zero, and the second value has to be, your trace has got to be on zero as well, so then they both can go to that up. Uh, okay, to the other. but my question is, some of the questions are addition, some of the questions are subtraction. Right. So you have to be able to choose one of the two. Yes. Upsell, yep. Because this is a demultiplexer. Okay, so getting back to what we talked about a little bit earlier today, like at the very beginning, what is the purpose of a demultiplexer? What does it do? Okay, can you be more specific? Yes. It has one input and multiple outputs. So the job of a demultiplexer is to connect the one input to one of the outputs. That's its job. What does it need to get the job done? Just pass the value to the selector here. Use opcell to select which output of the demultiplexer connects to the input. Okay, use OPSEL, which is this input pin here, to specify which output is connected to the input. Okay, so for addition, eh, this is already doing it because it's zero, 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 specifies that the input should connect to output zero. Okay, so right now the uh, ALU is actually doing its calculation already. And if you look at if you want to figure out you know, what are the bits inside the flex register, you can go all the way down here and then go to this output pin. This is register output and in the right order here, okay? In other words, I'm just, I just did one of the questions for you. Zero plus zero ends up with no carry. The Z flag is a one because the result is a zero. The sign flag is a zero because the most significant bit of the output is a zero. There's no overflow, because zero plus zero is a zero. Yeah. It's zero within the range of negative 128 to positive 127. Okay, so that means there's no overflow. The exclusive wall between the sign flag and the overflow flag is the L flag. Zero exclusive wall with zero is a zero. That explains the whole thing, okay? So you don't even have to explain the entire thing, okay? For people who want to take the shortcut, all they need to do is to replicate the bit pattern to the earlier part of this entire diagram, change this particular bit pattern, change this particular bit pattern, make sure you're selecting the right operation, and then just scroll, scroll all. <laughs> okay, there are two things. You have to look at the output, well, actually you don't because you know, the question actually does not even care about the actual output. And then just scroll all the way to the bottom and copy and paste the flag register output. So that would be the shortcut. Now, do I recommend the shortcut? Maybe after doing the first three or four manually, okay, you go like, okay, I get, I get it, okay, I know what this is about. Then you can go ahead and go for the shortcut to save you time. But I would probably would not suggest using the shortcut method unless you already know what the ALU is helping you to do. Because tedious math, eh, leave it to the processor. But you should at least know how it happens inside the ALU. So that's my recommendation. So getting back to your actual uh, quiz, okay? So there are what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think there are eight of them, or just seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight of these. So even though it looks kind of ugly and sounds really kind of involved, it's not, okay? Because if, if you use the method of using the ALU to help you figure out the actual flag, 
This will take you five, ten minutes at the most. If you were to do it manually, it would take you longer. But to do it manually is studying. Okay, so use kind of think about that. Okay, you know, do you want to just get get this lab done as quickly as possible, or do you want to use this as an opportunity so that you can double check it? Because you can do this manually first and then use the ALU to validate your answer. Okay, so that would be the best way to get this particular question done is to do it manually, at least for a few, okay, and then use the ALU only as a mechanism to validate your answer. If your answer is different from what the ALU is telling you, then you might have some misunderstanding or you just made a you know, simple mistake. It can be either one. But either case, it is a part of studying for you know, the rest of the semester because we're gonna use these flags until the end of the entire semester. So you, you should get familiarized with what each flag means and how it is computed. All right, so we still have 10 more minutes. Okay, so I'm moving forward a little bit unless there are questions about what this lab is about. Do we have any questions about this lab? Okay, now because I gave the other lab, the other class, until the end of today's to turn in this entire lab, I will do the same thing to you guys. So you don't have to finish the entire lab within the lab time. It is doable, okay, you know, I just, but I don't want to put too much pressure on people because you know, I want you to use this lab as a learning opportunity and not so much as, oh, I want to get all of those points. The point value is fairly insignificant, okay, with any lab. It is what you're learning in the lab that is important. So I'm going to, so don't do anything yet, but you cannot possibly do anything because I have not released the lab yet. So let me go ahead and change the time of the lab so that you have the rest of the day to do it. You should probably still do it as much as you can you know, in this lab here, so that if you have any questions, I will still be here to answer those questions. <coughs> All right, so let me change the time first, and then we'll probably move on. So this time I you know, basically let you see your quiz responses uh, after each attempt. <laughs> So I'm going to change it to the end of today. Okay, 11.59 is as late as I can get it. So here. And I also have to change the time when it discloses the answer. So I have to change this one. Oh, oh okay, so I cannot do it when I do that. October 22nd at midnight. Okay. Let me see if it, let me save it. The access code is joy. You might want to write it down, okay, just in case you need to spend more time than the lab. So write down the access code being joy, J O Y instead of J O I, which is in the instruction. Low with my mouse pointer. All right, so I'm going to save it first you know, without publishing it because I don't want people to start working on it right now because I still got five more minutes for the lecture. <coughs> so what are we going to talk about after this? We have basically introduced every single instruction. Some instructions have not been talked about by itself because it belongs to a family. So right now we have talked about um, the LDI instruction, the LD instruction, the ST instruction, which is down here. We talked about the compare instruction, the subtract instruction, and also the add instruction as well. But then the other ones, you know, like uh, right shift and the not instruction, and also the and and the or instruction, they are basically the same because they all have to go through the ALU. So the only difference between these instructions is which component of the ALU do they make use of? Because there are six components inside the ALU if you are to go to the main component here. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are six main components in the CP in the ALU. And the difference between those instructions, 
right shift, add, subtract, compare, not, and or, okay? So the only difference is which component do you think the input is going to? That's the only difference. In other words, they all operate at about basically the same fashion. It's just you know, what, are, what are you doing? Which path are you choosing to pass the values to? That's the only difference. All right, so getting back to the this table here. Um, and then you know, the uh, increment and decrement, they're kind of special, but we'll talk about this more in the next lab. And then we have the usual, the no-op instruction, doesn't really have to be explained much. And then the halt instruction, we also explained it today. This is the only instruction that we haven't really talked about. It is just copying register Y to register X, okay? So if you want to exercise, you know, how to track down how things are connecting, this will be a good one to do. It's relatively simple compared to almost everything that we have talked about so far. So you can exercise you know, how to see how it gets the job done, how PTP gets the job done with this specific instruction. So I would recommend that as an exercise for you guys to do. All right, so with all the instructions already introduced, we are actually moving on to um, assemb actual assembly language programming. So the first um, module in this case is called compiling C control structures. So what this particular module talks about is looking at a C program, okay, looking at a conditional statement like this, and we are going to quote unquote flatten it into something like this. So this might take some time for some people to understand. Other people can look at this and go like, yep, I get it right away. Some other people may go like, okay, I need a little bit more time to digest this. This is what we'll be talking about on Thursday. So if you look at this and go like, I have no idea what it is, that means you, know, you can spend a little bit of time today or tomorrow to take a look at this and go like, okay, are we really sure? Am I convinced that if the original code looks like this, then the new code looking at this would do exactly the same thing, except it just looks weird. The only thing you need to understand is what is a go-to? A go-to is a JMPI, but in C++. Okay, it just continues, it continues execution at whatever label that you specify. It so, they, hmm? yep, it just, it just jumps. jumps. Yep. Mm -hmm. But this is the then statement of this go to. Okay. And the else, there's no else to this entire conditional statement because the else is corresponding to this entire block here. When you send it to do non C at the beginning? Hmm? When you send it to do the non C at the beginning? Because label L1 is right before block 2 which in the original code is the else branch. The else, you want to go to the else branch if and only if the condition C is false. In other words, I right. want this program, or I want this code to be exactly performing the same thing as this code over here. So I want to perform block two if and only if C is false. I want to perform block one if and only if C is true. So that's why you know, you know, C is negated if the go to is going to L1. Okay, so uh, section three talks about control structure. It's relatively short, by the way. And then uh, section four talks about you know, how do we convert the statements. Because the bottom line is I want to convert a not so that it doesn't have a not anymore by complicating the control structure because you know, now we have one additional go-to. I want to look at an or expression and get rid of the or but that complicates the control structure because now we have two conditional branch instructions. So basically this section uh, essentially is talking about um, just that. Okay. And then you know, we talk about comparison, how you know, only less than is really required, um, and then generally you know, how do we compare. So I think if you can just kind of glance through this, and just kind of jot down some notes, write down some questions, so that when we get to this particular uh, content, you can ask the question. That'll be great. Okay, this is actually it's simpler for some people, and it's more difficult for other people. It really depends on how well do you know the control structure in C plus plus already. Okay, um, so that's what we are doing on Thursday. With this tool, okay, after we talk about this. 
then the rest for the entire rest of the semester, I'll be presenting C code to you and you'll be converting that code into assembly in TTT. So that's basically what we're gonna do, you know, basically for the rest of the semester. So with most people teaching this class, that's the only thing they teach for the entire semester. All 16 weeks is just you know, writing code. For me, I use the first half of the class to go from transistors all the way to the processor. So we talk a little bit about the organization inside the processor and also how logic gates work and also how you know, flip-flops work, how SR Lexus work and so on and so forth. But then once we have the processor already implemented in logic thing, we can now actually write code to run inside the ALE. Okay, so that's, you know, this is where the big shift is, you know, for this class. We'll be coding from here on. All right. Uh, so. Is this going to the exam? Huh? Is this the, like the last week or um, the second exam? It depends. You know, the, the second exam is going to be in week 11. This is week 9. So probably a little bit of this will go into the second exam. Yep. All right, so it is time for me to stop lecturing and shift to the lab. So let me open up the lab first because you cannot see it yet. I cannot remember the name, so I'm just gonna have to look for it. Okay, it's, uh, oh, I did mention to that I will make it do later. Oops, okay, that's the right one. I thought I made the adjustment already. Maybe I didn't save it. No. Okay. So we want to make it do at the end of today, 11.59 p.m. And the answers will be I cannot turn on this option because if I turn on this option, you know, it will just show you the actual answer. It won't let me have that option. Okay. Save and publish. There we go. All right. So now you can start to work on this. Oh, this is the wrong one. Never mind. <laughs> this is the wrong, the wrong one. This is not the lab for today. Okay, forget about this one. Don't do it. Don't even try it. Okay, that's my bad. My bad. So the one that we want to work on today is simple branching and code analysis. Let me turn this one off and turn this one on. Okay, so this is the one that we are working on today. The access code is joy. There we go. Mm. I'll write it on the board too. J-O-I. All right. So I'm gonna go get some water to drink and I'll be back. Yep. Hmm? It's locked? Did you, can you ask the question again, please? Mm, so it depends on what you're referring to. I don't think you need to change the processor. The only thing you need to change would be the content of RAM. Are you referring to the value of the registers? Okay. Well, I mean, you can make the changes, you know, but you, know, you have to be sure that the changes that you're making is not altering the behavior of the processor. So other than that, you can make your changes if you want. All right. So let me... Stop the...